Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here with us for our first in-person Cafe Sci in two years. Yeah, this is great, right? Uh, for those of you who have not been tuning in for our virtual Cafe Sci, my name is Brad Peroni. I'm a program manager here at the Science Center in our uh, team and community engagement department. And uh, our team will be here with you for Cafe Sci uh, <clears throat> from this point out. Uh, before we introduce tonight's speaker, a couple of notes about Cafe Sci. Number one, uh, Cafe Sci is presented by PPG and sponsored by Cook Myosite, and it is also supported by generous donations from Cafe Sci fans such as yourself. If anybody feels uh, that they would like to do the best thing that they can for Cafe Sci, well, that best thing would be to bring some friends next time and uh, get some more folks in these seats. We want to see as many folks here for Cafe Sci as possible. Uh, we have been, uh, as I mentioned, presenting Cafe Sci virtually uh, over the pandemic. Uh, we will uh, be moving toward a hybrid presentation where we'll do live on site and streaming, uh, but we're getting the first uh, bugs worked out of the system. So for now, if you have someone who would like to see this presentation and they're not able to join us this evening, uh, all of our Cafe Sci uh, programs will be archived on Carnegie Science Center's YouTube channel, uh, so you can check this out at youtube.com for that. But the reason you're all here this evening, uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. David Bem. Uh, David Bem is Vice President, Science and Technology, and Chief Technology Officer of PPG. Since 2016, Dr. Bem is a member of the PPG Operating Committee and serves as Assistant, Sec <clears throat> excuse me, Assistant Secretary of the Board's Technology and Environment Committee. Dr. Bem is active with many industry organizations and in 2021 was elected a National Academy of Engineering member, one of the highest professional honors accorded an engineer. He has authored more than 20 technical publications and is named in nine United States patents. Since 2019, Dr. Bem is a member of the board of directors of Brady Corporation, serving on the Management Development and Compensation Committee and the Technology Committee. He also serves on the advisory board of Carnegie Science Center. With that, my friends, it is my pleasure to welcome David Bem. Okay, I get to take my mask off, I'm told. So, well, thank you all for coming out. It's great to have an opportunity to speak to all of you in this first in-person Cafe Sci uh, in two years, so it's great. And hopefully I can, uh, get you a little bit excited about the science behind coding, something you probably not really thought very much about before. But first, let's, I'll, start, oh, whoops, I'll start first by talking to you about PPG. PPG, if you're all from Pittsburgh, I assume everyone who here is from Pittsburgh, has been in this community for a long time, but it's a company that's very different than what it was when it was founded 130 some years ago. So with that, we'll start off with a little quick video just about this local company that's right here in your own town. 47,000 employees come to work every day to help communities come together and grow in more inspiring spaces, to preserve the environment for future generations, to protect the world around us from the elements and everything else. At PPG, what drives us is our purpose, our passion to create products that protect and beautify what matters most to you. Products that enable you to make a home that's distinctively yours. To show off your personality. To make lasting memories like this. And to rest a little easier. At PPG, our family of researchers, chemists, and professionals in more than 70 countries around the world have one purpose. We protect and beautify the world talking today about how we protect and beautify the world, and more importantly, we're gonna get a little bit excited about what coatings do and how they're fascinating materials. So first of all, on your way and your life today, I would project that each of you interacted with one of the coatings from PPG today at least once, maybe 10 times, maybe 100 times, depending on what you did. We're literally in all types of applications and surfaces, so we like to say internally, if it moves, we code it, and if it doesn't move, we code it. So you can find us on buildings. We're here in the, in the Science Center right here. 
You can find us in electronics. We're on your car. We're on your, we're, uh, could be on the halls and walls of your home. So it's a great company where we get to see the output of our work every day in our everyday lives. And just a little quick history. Of course, you guys all know PPG has been here for about 138 years inside of Pittsburgh. And of course, it wasn't founded on coatings at all. It invented an industrial, like so many, so many companies here in Pittsburgh, it was founded on a new material process to make flat glass. And it was originally called Pittsburgh Plate Glass. But in the last 15 years, the company has completely transformed itself. Today, the only glass that PPG makes is aerospace glass. The entire remaining part of our company focuses on coatings and the functions that they can bring into the world. Um, we, we are based right here in Pittsburgh in the big glass tower right there, down there by the skating rink that you can see across the river. And we currently have about 50,000 employees. Now I'm gonna show you some examples when we start to talk a little bit more sciencey, but one of the things that I'm really proud of of my job is we really do help uh, sustain things in the most simple way. If you think of what you might coat or paint every day, you often are extending its life, whether it's your car, your home, maybe your cupboards in your house, you're extending its life. And when we do that, we don't use more materials. So that's a really huge uh, sustainability advantage that we all bring. But inside of what we do in PPG today, almost a third of what we sell is sustainably advantaged in some way. And we really are looking to increase that. And we think that our future is bright and how we can help the world both reuse, keep things in good, great shape, and really help sustain the globe in a better way. Another big part that many of you are familiar with us, I'm sure, because of our outreach into the community. We uh, really focus in three areas. We focus in STEM education, social justice, and really improving the communities around us through a program called Colorful Communities. Now, this is a really great program that we do. And we're gonna talk about the psychology of color a little bit later, but where we go out and we actually uh, help improve um, community spaces to help really improve the experience of people inside of them. And I have one more video here show you a little bit about that and then I won't overload you with videos too much after this. This is a 50 year PPG's Colorful Communities program helping thousands and thousands of people around the world helping brighten their lives and helping bring PPG associates together in the teamwork environment and the ability to give back to our communities. Have PPG come in and be so meticulous and thoughtful about the colors of paint, about the way that the colors flow, is gonna make a huge impact on our participants. It really shows the heart of what we are at PPG, which is to protect and beautify the world. A lot of spaces that our kids are at, a lot of times they don't get that interaction with caring adults. So for them to see people giving their own time to do something for them has a huge impact on our young people. All these children, actually, they don't have any experience on art. I see these children, they were lonely, but suddenly they found that this world is something so colorful. Ultimately, this uh, helps to improve the environment, uh, to integrate themselves and the company with the community we work in, uh, and definitely to make a better world. We invited 150 people of the PPG and the staff. The staff of the PPG and the staff of the PPG have been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. We have also been invited to our students and friends. The reactions we tend to get in any country, in any culture, you should see the smiles on their face, the happiness, sense of gratitude that we took our time to come in, make it a special day for them and make a difference in their world. We, our employees go out, we we'll, can often work with our customers also. We'll go out in the community and really enhance the the surroundings of the site that we go to. I've been on about 15 of these personally. They're really rewarding and they have a great impact overall. So now let's get into a little bit of science. So that's all the, all the good corporate stuff about PPG and probably know a little bit more about us now. Let's talk about the science of coatings and how fascinating they are. So I love this picture because, you know, we we're just talking about in colorful communities, how when we would go out and paint something, how it can have an impact on people. 
And what really surprises me as I really thought about both this talk and as I moved into the coatings industry only six years ago is how important color is to people. And it really speaks out when you start to think of some staggering things. Like the first paints are over 100,000 years old. And these cave paintings that I have behind me are 30, from 30,000 BC. So think back in 30,000 BC, what would your priorities be? Would it be to paint a cave? I'm not so sure. I think it's probably don't get eaten. Make sure you can get yourself some food, right? Get yourself some water. But the need for color and to change the space and help the psychology was so strong that people took the time to both invent and then start to paint caves. You know, all through our history, if you were able to go to the, to the Pompeii exhibit here, one of the things people don't realize is how colorful everything really was whenever it was really in its prime as opposed to what we see today. And there's examples through, through, through history of using beetles back in 5000 BC to use beetles to make different paints. So people have just been driven to put color in different spaces through humanity. So it seems to be something that's sort of like a core need that we all have. I think if you have just sort of, sort of white and gray around you, uh, you'll naturally try to seek color, whether it's through nature or through things that you can change. It's a really strong drive. So it's something that I think really we can help with. Sorry click in the wrong direction. So what the heck is a paint anyway? So now we'll go a little bit into modern paint. Did anyone get to come to the Da Vinci uh, special exhibit here at the Science Center? Do you remember at Da Vinci, they talked about how when he painted, he painted with multiple layers and he used those layers to create different effects. And when we think of designing coatings, we think of both how you make the coating itself, which would have these components. It's got a pigment, that's the thing that gets left behind. It's got a resin, which is really, for those of you who might be uh, chemists or scientists, there's a polymer. Resin is just an old term because it came from trees originally. It's what's left behind to make the material. Then it's got some sort of solvent in there. Could be water, could be a hydrocarbon solvent. And then there's all sorts of little additives to make it work better. So it doesn't drip, so it doesn't splatter. They're rarely used just as a single layer. In fact, when we engineer coding systems, we think of them as these stacks. And these stacks let us pull tricks like Da Vinci did. We can change the appearance. We can change how, it, how the color might change as you look at it from different angles. We call that the flop. Or we can build other functionality into those layers. We can have layers that are transparent to certain wavelengths and reflect back. And I'll show you how that stack becomes a real engineered material that we work on and can create unique effects for. So how do we create coatings anyway? So first, some again, a little bit of just facts. PPG is a $17 billion company. We spend about 400, this year we'll announce we spent $463 million on research and development. That's a very big number. That puts us in the top in the chemical industry, puts us absolutely in the top in the coatings industry. And what we work on here in this area is about making those coating stacks and coming up with different ways to create unique coatings. We have about 4,000 employees around the world that work in science and technology. And here in the Pittsburgh area, we have about 1,000-ish here in the Pennsylvania Pittsburgh area. So where are we then? It's a good Pittsburgher map here, right? We see the rivers. We actually have research centers and people developing these systems in Monroeville, Springdale, which is up the Allegheny River, Harmer, which is, uh, I'm sure you guys know there's the Harmer Eagles over there, right? So over by the cliffs there, Allison Park, our main coding center. And then of course, we put the Carnegie Science Center on there for you guys to see where we are relative to everything. So those are our four main sites here in the Pittsburgh area. And what do people do? You know, what kind of backgrounds do people have that go into these kind of coding sciences? Well, we have people that are polymer scientists, Formulation scientists, these are people that work on how you mix different chemicals and materials together to get special effects. We have people who are application experts. They typically have engineering backgrounds and they, and from the uh, application side, they actually work on different technologies to actually apply coatings. And then we have a whole bunch of people that figure out different ways to test things. These can be classical tests where we look at the molecular structure of the coatings that we make, or they might be things where we are looking at, how does this piece of metal corrode? Or what would happen if this is a ship haul and it's in the ocean for 
for 30 years. What's going to happen to this thing? We've got teams of people that that's what they try to figure out. And I really love history. I often try to put history into a lot of my, my talks. And one of the things that I found fascinating about PPG is how the history of Pittsburgh is ingrained in sort of its core technology areas. And when we put this picture up, as you all know, Pittsburgh's history, big industrial center of the world, really was the center of the universe on materials for a long time. Steel, glass, uh, wood treatments, aluminum, all these companies were formed here and really were industrialized in this area. And particularly in the area of metals, it really shows through in PPG. A majority of PPG, $16 billion, somewhere around 9 billion of it, comes from us finding ways to prevent corrosion inside of metals. And that you experience every day. So if you drove here in a car, about a 50 to 60% chance, depending on which car you're driving, that has a PPG product in it, which is called Electrocoat, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And it's the reason that your car doesn't rust anymore. Many of you, I'm old enough to remember, cars used to rust before they wore out. Today, they don't really rust anymore. Uh, we put, we create coatings that help buildings stay up. And so there's the PNC tower. So there's aluminum extrudates on there and we have coatings on there that really protect them and give them a long durability. Of course, we put bridges and ships on here and everything down to the drain pipes that are enabled that prevent corrosion for these new low water applications that we all have to help save the environment. So this really has been a key area for PPG. And I would argue because of our location, because our neighbors are in these industries and they help our employees see the opportunities. It's really put us in a really strong position in industry for metal coatings and how they prevent corrosion. And we have some cool videos out there. If there's anyone here who's a science educator, these videos, which are on the Paints, but Pur Paints with Purpose webpage uh, of ours, are really showing surprising examples where you interact with coatings and where there's unique science behind them. Uh, it's a great resource for you. Some of you might remember we actually did a, a small uh, uh, special where we did this paw path that was on Good Morning America, and we were demonstrating how we can uh, reflect heat off of concrete with coatings. And it was pretty popular online, and it was kind of cool because I got to be in Good Morning America, which is pretty cool. So we'll start working on coatings that you might have experienced before. This first coating is an architectural coating. So that would be what we, a fancy name for what we call you know, this coating here on the wall or what you put on in your kitchen. And at PPG, we uh, recently released this product called uh, Ultralast. Now, Ultralast is really special in the market. Everyone is, uh, when you put a paint up, one of the key things is that it stays bright and it really just doesn't get dirty and that it doesn't mark up. And traditionally, the way architectural paints deal with dirt is through a test, you're gonna be surprised, it's called a scrub test and it's exactly what you think it is. They take, uh, a, an abrasive pad and they scrape the paint and they basically rub the paint and they're basically scrubbing the stain or whatever it is off of that paint. And really what it's measuring is not does it resist the dirt or is the dirt going to be there? It's measuring how strong the paint is to the adhesive pad. And if you mark it up, can your eyes see the markup from the adhesive pad? So you're basically scraping paint off whenever you do that. We took technology that we developed to help prevent fingerprints on the screens of your, of your cell phones. And we took a technology that we developed to help keep cars clean, uh, which was called Ceramiclear, which was originally developed so that when it rains, dirt falls off your car. We took those two technologies and combined them together and put them inside of an architectural paint. And the result is that we made a different type of paint for cleaning. So this Ultralast, there's nothing like it on the market. Basically, stains don't go on it. The surface repels them. So even if you were to get lipstick on it or something pretty aggressive, you can just take a wipe and wipe it right off and it comes right off there. And it's really enabled by the polymer chemistry that we put in and the surface chemistry. So what you do in order to help make a stain resistant is you actually make this, the surface have a charge on it so that it repels those stains. And that's in fact what we did. And more importantly, we did it in a really simple way to allow it to be used in a relatively simple to apply product. But we didn't stop there because I keep pointing the wrong direction. 
Because then we got this thing called COVID and people got really worried about viruses and bacteria. And we took a set of tricks that we had learned about managing microbes, um, really originally from our marine coatings area. So when you coat a ship, you often coat it with a, with a coating that has copper in it. And that copper helps keep growth off of the ship. We had a partner, Corning, they're based in New York, who developed a unique technology to deliver copper uh, outside, out of, uh, to the surface of a coating, and specifically a coating that's based on water, which an architectural paint is. And we developed copper armor. Now, copper armor is an antimicrobial and antiviral paint. So it basically is the only paint on the market today that's actually certified that it terminates viruses within, we have very specific wording, so my lawyers will shoot me if I don't say it right. But uh, basically it will uh, kill viruses. It will also kill um, microbes. So again, a health and safety uh, product that we were able to respond through this really recent pandemic that we're all here with. And how it works is it literally attacks the organism and kills it in a safe way with copper. That little picture here, that's an electron microscopy picture and that's showing you little copper uh, crystals that are inside of the paint. So we love cars at PPG. It's one of our strongest areas in terms of car coatings. We've done all sorts of interesting things to help your car look more flat black or to make it shiny, to make it have what we call high chroma colors. And we do that by really playing with all the layers of coatings that are in a car. Most people don't realize how many coatings there are. So when a car is built, it really starts with what's called a body in white. That's the frame of your car. That metal is cleaned and then it's treated to help it prevent corrosion with what's called a pretreatment coating. That's basically where we apply a very light chemical wash treatment that goes in and interacts with the metal surface and prepares it for the electrocoat process, which is the anti-corrosion process that PPG invented right here in Pittsburgh in the 1960s and is today used in every automobile factory in the world. Then the thing that you see, the base coat, that's where the color comes from. And then a nice clear coat on top, that's what keeps your car all nice, clean, and shiny. But we do other things. We make coatings that go underneath your car and keep them from coating from the bottom up. We put coatings on there that help keep the vibrations down. A lot of people think that they don't get car sick because they're sitting in the front seat. The reality is you're sitting in the front seat, it has the lowest number of vibrations from low frequency vibrations, which is where your stomach gets upset from. And that's really caused by these kind of dampening materials that are stuck, in and su stuck inside of cars. Increasingly, cars are glued together versus welded. That allows mixed materials to be used, and we make those types of adhesives and sealants. And then there's all sorts of parts and things that have to go on the car. Think of a rear view mirror, a roof rack, all those colors have to match. These are all coatings areas that PPG focuses on inside of the car world. It's a pretty labor intensive place. So what can you do with this? It sounds like, well, everybody does this, but not true. So if you've ever had the pleasure of being in a car factory, when a car is being assembled, one of the largest parts of that assembly factory is what's called the paint shop. And if we look on the standard side, it has all these steps I talked about. The car comes in, it's cleaned, it's pre-treated, it goes through what's called e-coat, then it's baked, then it's cooled down, then it's sanded, then it's sealed, then it's primed. I mean, look at all these steps. Baked again through, through a paint area, comes back out, it's baked again, then it's cooled down, then it's inspected, and if everything came out right, down the line it goes. If it has imperfections, they sand it, send it through again. So it's a lot of steps, a lot of time, a lot of energy. So we looked at that process and we thought about these coating stacks and we developed what's called a wet on wet process. So it was an ability to start to stack different wet coating layers on top of each other, use the, the uh, chemistry of what's called phase separation to basically be able to keep them separate from each other and then reduce the number of steps that they have to do in an auto factory. And what it really does is it removes ovens and those ovens are the most energy intensive part of manufacturing a car. So if you look at the B1, B2, it's called base one, base two, it's a little inside jargon, but really what we did is we removed steps and we removed ovens. So we reduced the footprint needed to actually make that paint shop, but more importantly, we reduced the energy that's used inside of a car factory. So since this has been implemented in, in, uh, around the world, it's in many paint factories today, but not all of them, 
roughly about half of them are using this process today. Um, we've reduced enough CO2 from the energy reduction from this reduced oven footprint to remove about 2 million cars off the road. So it's a very significant impact in terms of uh, potential greenhouse gas emissions. And it is a real benefit to bring a high quality finish at a lower cost to our customers and inside of um, in, with, with coatings technology. So of course you've all used like an inkjet printer. And I think a lot of people think, well, I can, I can print anything on my inkjet printer. Why don't I see that being used kind of everywhere for every type of application? Well, the reality is there's some problems with inkjet printing. Um, one has to do with the little, the size of the nozzles and how the, how, the, uh, how the liquids are shot out of them. But the other really has to do with the durability and what's called the UV stability or the weatherability of the colors. Have you ever noticed when you print something with your UV printer, a year later, maybe that yellow doesn't look so yellow anymore. Maybe the orange has changed to light pink. That's the color stability. And that's really based on the types of materials they have to use inside of an inkjet printing. However, this technology continues to evolve. And the idea of using these piezoelectrics or using very small channels to deliver precise applications of color has continued to expand. And we've tried to move them into paints. And a big difference between a paint and an ink has to do with the pigments, that UV stability, and really uh, how much of the pigment is inside of the material as it's being delivered. So here we're showing kind of two ways that you can do it. You can do it through what's called jetting. And as you jet it, you're releasing droplets. Now, if the droplets kind of stretch out in the wrong way, they splatter and they don't make a very good finish. So we need to really control these droplets and we do that with what's called rheology. And rheology is simply the thickness of the material under a mechanical strain and how it recovers. So often people will use examples like ketchup to think about rheology. Since we're here in Pittsburgh, we got Heinz ketchup, you know how you beat on the back of the bottle and it becomes thixotropic and it starts to pour out. That's a great example of the rheology of ketchup where we're looking at what happens under a mechanical strain. We spend a lot of time doing the science of rheology as we make coatings because it changes how those coatings apply and what the final surface looks like overall. So I'm gonna show you a cool video. So this is brand new. Oops, I don't even think you can buy this car yet. I think it's on the market maybe this year. Sorry, I hit the button too many times. There we go. So this is the first application of a, of a precision painting technology. So this is paint going on the back of an M4, I think is a BMW, forgive me guys. And you can see that's a little bit sped up, but that is basically what's called maskless painting. And it's being done right by that robot. And it's that, that jetting technology that I just showed you. And this is uh, that car, I believe, is available this year. And this is increasingly being adopted. And that technology was invented right here in Pittsburgh to make that coating work. But there's a huge change happening in cars. I don't know if anyone drove here in an electric vehicle, but certainly you've probably seen more electric vehicles in the last three years than you had in the previous previous 50 years of your life or however long you've been looking at cars, they're certainly here and they're here to stay. And when we looked at them inside of our company, once again, what did we see? We saw coatings everywhere. And we saw coatings where we could play with the stacks, those coating stacks, and we could add functionality that matters. Now, what's so special about a battery, an electric vehicle? If you were to tear one apart, they're made up of thousands of small battery cells. They're almost the size of a AA battery, a little bit bigger. And they're all put together in what's called a battery pack. So imagine thousands of battery cells put into a gigantic battery pack, which becomes the floor of the vehicle. But there's a lot of stuff around that to make those batteries work. That stuff are cooling and heating systems because we've moved from a, a reaction that's basically combustion inside of your car to an electrochemical reaction. And we're gonna show you what that means in terms of temperature control, but it requires a lot more control of temperature inside of that space. We've got to make it just the right temperature for those batteries to work. We also have to control what are called dielectric properties. So these are basically the insulating properties of these coatings. We want these batteries to work the way that they're designed to work. We don't want short circuits to happen. We want those dielectric protection to happen. So we've got to coat metal surfaces and make sure they're protective. 
Of course, we got to make sure it doesn't rust because you know, you're going to go buy this battery car. You don't want the batteries to fall out of it from rust. And you certainly, if you're in a car accident, you don't want that battery box to be opened up because these lithium ion batteries are potentially very flammable and dangerous. So those are some of the coating areas we see in the battery box. In addition, how do you make the cell itself? They actually take a, a film of aluminum or a film of copper and they cast, a, they cast a coating on it. And that coating has a lithium material in it or, or a carbon material in it, depending on if it's the anode or cathode. And so we look at that and say, well, we can make a, a paint system for that. We can take those active lithium materials. We don't make them, other people make them, but we can help suspend those into a coating and we can bring productivity to the battery maker so that they can make these batteries cheaper. Really important thing to happen. So again, let's, let's talk about temperature control. So many of you, you've got cell phones, you've got computers, you felt when they heat up, sometimes they can get really hot on you. Uh, you've also probably experienced, if you've been out in cold weather with a cell phone, they might unexpectedly shut down or suddenly you don't have any power. Your just battery drains really quickly. And that's really because we've moved to this electrochemical reaction. And when we do that, we see we have temperature really in a couple places and how, how the electrons are going to move. Um, we have temperature up there in the numerator of that battery potential, and it's also buried in those two terms, the re reactant, the reductant and oxidant activity. So temperature is everywhere here. Temperature drives the, the capability of this. And when it's too cold, our charge goes way down, doesn't perform very well. The discharge gets really sluggish. Not good, nobody wants that. And then on the other extreme, if it gets too hot, uh-oh, it runs away, catches on fire, sets the, sets the um, electrolyte inside the battery on fire, and then creates a metal fire, which is not pretty, and creates a really dangerous situation. So all the battery technology work that's been going on in the last years has really focused a lot on this thermal management and making sure that we can improve that most time. And we do that through coatings. So we've developed coatings that go on to, to, um, to aluminum, uh, aluminum cooling systems that have low dielectric properties. So that means they're insulating, as well as they have high thermal conductivity. So they help transfer heat effectively through the EVs. For us, we're super excited about this because when we look at a car, we think of the potential amount of coating on a car. And I'll do it, you know, I'm in business, so I got to do it in dollars. But we look at all that surface area. And an average car, normal internal combustion car, has about $100 of coatings on it, roughly, about 100 bucks. I know they charge you more when you get the metallic paint. It's about 100 bucks. And if you go to an EV, that quickly changes to between two and $300 and can go as high as over $1,000 per vehicle in coating. So for us, this is a big area and a very exciting area for us from a research and development standpoint. So more about layers, layers, layers everywhere. We can create functionality for heating and cooling as we talked about through thermal transfer. We can create functionality uh, for electrical uh, resistance changes, and we can create functionality to reflect wavelengths that control heating and cooling. And a real example here is uh, a highly reflective coating that we affectionately internally call our eggplant solution. It's currently used on Southwest Airlines. The blue color that's on there is a great example of this. And it's a three layer system. So we take a dark coating, which normally you'd think of would absorb a lot of heat. And we make that dark coating, what's called NIR transparent. And NIR is the near infrared. And those are the wavelengths that generate the most heat and exciting the material when they come in. So we make it transparent to a very specific part of the NIR wavelength. And behind it, we basically stick a mirror, a mirror for that very same wavelength so it reflects right back out. And when we do that, we can actually manage solar heat. We can reduce the energy load on an airplane when it's on a hot runway. We can keep that material, that airplane fundamentally cooler by as much as, you know, of course it's over time, but it can be as much as 10 or 15 degrees just from this painting stack being put in. And of course we can apply that to buildings. We can apply that, this was really, if you saw the paw path video, this was a demonstration of this technology. So it really allows us to control heat management. But I like to think of it, and internally we call it wavelength management, so we can do even more. If I can get the thing to change. So 
So of course, we're in Pittsburgh and we're blessed with a lot of autonomous car startups. You know, you can see the Argo AI cars driving around. You used to see the Uber cars driving around. I haven't seen them recently. There's a Bosch car that drives around. And on them, they all have this thing called LiDAR, which is a light, uh, a light detecting technology. They have radars on them and they have cameras on them. And they're all using that to identify what's around them. And we learned again, being blessed that we're in Pittsburgh, one of the centers of this technology. Oh, probably seven years ago at this point, one of our researchers knew somebody at one of these companies and they were hearing about all the problems they were having with dark colors. But basically the LIDARs weren't reflecting the dark colors back very well. And it was actually causing sensitivity problems in the car. So we can take that very same trick we just showed you on Southwest Airlines, and we can make a dark color that's transparent to the specific LIDAR wavelength, send it through that, reflect it back, and we can increase the visibility of dark colors uh, by uh, using, this, using this technique. And it can go as much as 30 to 40% higher reflectivity. That means longer distances, better safety overall. And again, all just with playing with these paint stacks. What do we do? We play with the pigments, we play with the layering system, and we manage it. And I have two examples on here for LIDAR and for radar, which is your adaptive braking and how, you know, colors like silver, for example, can create problems with that. So before I end, I like I do an audience participation. So which of these items has the most coding technology? And if you're from PPG, you're not allowed to answer. Soda cans or beer cans, pick your favorite. A car, the F-35 stealth, stealth uh, weapons platform or a deep sea oil rig. Anyone wanna take a guess? Oil rig, any other answers? Yeah. Jet, that's pretty cool. Nope, you're gonna be surprised. It's the can, it's the can and the jet is high tech. But what makes a can so hard to make? What makes a can so hard to make is they make a factory makes a billion cans a year. They move between 90 and 180 cans per minute through a line. And we have to assemble different coatings onto this can to protect that aluminum, uh, either on the inside, the outside, or the top or the bottom. Now, fun fact, about 80% of the technology and companies that, are, that make can coatings are based right here in Pittsburgh. It's basically PPG and Cheryl Williams, formerly Valspar, over here by, uh, by Swickley. And it should surprise none of us because of course, where do lumen beverage cams come from? Arconic and Alcoa. So big surprise that we're all here and we all are the people that know how to, to do this right here in our very own city. So it is extremely challenging to put basically a coating, the thickness of a hair inside of a can at 120 cans per minute speed and to do it reproducibly so that it works all the time. So people think about their cans, they don't necessarily think there's a coating inside, but there is. There's also coatings on the outside. And of course you see those, right? But those coatings have to do things like help that can move down that manufacturing line and not get beat up. But they also have to survive trucking. And this is an actual picture of a can where that outside coating doesn't have the friction properties that it needs for transportation, it creates a lot of product damage. Now you guys all know the cans are possibly the most sustainable packaging that we have available to us today. Most aluminum can be fully recycled. A lot of the aluminum in the world is recycled. The coatings make up a very small amount of these cans. So in essence, during the recycling process, they're an energy source to actually let that, uh, that aluminum be, be reused. And certainly the popularity of cans and can usage has gone way up. I am a beer drinker, and we all know that beer is better out of a can than out of a bottle. So proud to say we're working on these cans. But this is certainly one of the trickiest coating applications that there is. And yes, the F-35 is also really cool, but just not as just a different type of challenge. So again, everywhere we look, we see coatings. And here at the Science Center, there's a, there's a maker's space or a fab lab here. And it's focused on what's called additive manufacturing. I'm sure many of you have seen it and touched additive manufacturing. But additive manufacturing historically really is done in a couple of ways, either through sintering technologies where you put a hot source like a laser on a material and you melt it. So if it's a plastic, it would be what's called a thermoplastic, 
which is a material that can undergo a melt and a reforming, or they can use metals. You can use titanium or certain steels and you can melt it with a sintering process. There's also these, uh, like we have over here in the fab lab here, they would be thermoplastic ribbons. So they look like a, like a wire, but it's really not a wire. And you're basically, again, melting plastic and you're building up a part. So that's great. They're a little bit on the slow side. If you've ever done it, you find it takes a while to print things. There's also a problem that as you put layer on layer on layer together in additive, that those layers, they, they tend to be strong in two dimensions, but not in this third dimension though. Just, you can pull them apart, they break easy. And so it kind of limits what you can do with additive manufacturing. So again, we have some scientists, everything, they see coatings everywhere and they say, shoot this additive manufacturing, then this is just coatings problem. Most of the coatings that we make, we do chemistry in the field. Out the coating goes, I mean, if you've coated the floor of your garage, you're doing chemistry out there. You're putting an epoxy down, that thermostat chemistry is happening right there in your hands. And we worked, uh, on a technology which is called additive reactive extrusion. So we're basically doing chemistry at the point of the additive manufacturing tip, and we're putting coatings down layer by layer by layer. And it allows us to make a material that has unique properties in that one, it's fast. It's a lot faster than what you can do with a traditional additive manufacturing machine. You know, we're still learning how fast it can go, but we have demonstrated we can go almost two orders of magnitude faster, that's important from a productivity standpoint. And secondly, it gives us really good strength in the Z direction. So this is really new to the world technology. Again, invented right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that is one of the first machines that has ever been built. We're currently making aerospace parts with this. And uh, I'm proud to say last year, we delivered our first set of parts and it's the ramp seal on the C-130. So the C-130 is a large cargo airplane that's used by the US military. That little ramp thing that's down there, it's got all these gaskets that go around it. Those wear out and they were built basically by hand. Uh, there's not a large number of them that are ordered and we were able to demonstrate that we can additively manufacture these. But we've shown this technology can make all sorts of great things and it's something that we're pretty proud of right now and we have a lot of hope for. So your neighbors invented cool stuff. So before I, I kind of wrap it up and take some dialogue and discussion, you know, I wanted to really show you that this glass company way back in the late 1800s has completely changed itself in the coatings. And coatings are much more uh, interesting and scientifically enriching than I think a lot of people give them credit for. They help us do all sorts of things every day. You interact with them all the time. And I really just kind of put our, we call this our greatest hit slide, and sort of the technologies that came right here out of technology uh, that was developed inside of PPG or inside of Pittsburgh. So with that, we can take any questions, thank you. It's really hard to see, so if anyone, yeah. <laughs> I can't really see if anyone's asking. Oh, we'll take care of that. Thank you, David, for, for that uh, presentation. Uh, you know, if, if I can paraphrase poorly, you know, they say sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, but maybe in some cases, it's just so ingrained into uh, the everyday life that you don't even notice anymore how amazing all of those things are. I think that's a very true statement. Uh, so we have two microphones here. I have one and Anna in the yellow sweatshirt has one. Anna will work uh, that left side of the room. I'll work on this right side of the room. You've got a question here? Um, thanks for a great presentation. So I was walking by a friend's new um, Ford F-150, I think last fall. And as I walked by it in the sun's bright sunny day in Pittsburgh, and it went from being the black that I thought it was across the parking lot to being a nice brown there. And I commented to her, she says, yeah, it's got the kind of color reflective paints. And I wondered, I remember when those came out first 10 or 15 years ago, they were a big splash and you walk by and see the whole spectrum. This was a more subtle one. And I wondered if you're selling a lot of those or how much of a market there is for those. Oh yeah, so there's, you know, that, there's that very, you know, as you say, kind of in your face color shifting that goes on. But that's a trend that's been around for a long time. It's a lot more subtle than you think. Um, those different car manufacturers should select different levels of that to help change the appearance of the car. Particularly, you know, they can make rounded edges look a little sharper. They use shading. 
In fact, the kind of fun story, and I wish I could remember the person's name, but way back in the 30s and 20s, there was a, a colorist at PPG, actually, who invented uh, what he called reverse camouflage. And he went to, what was his name, Alfred Sloan, a GM at the time, and he took the same car and they painted it three different ways. And they made the car look longer, they made it look shorter, and they made it look taller. And the legend goes that it was so convincing that Sloan had his engineers out there with rulers thinking that they cheated, but it was all just done with color effects. And it was a colorist that came out of the military, had folk learned all about how you camouflage and was just playing the games of shading and reflectivity in reverse. And that very effect is used that way in cars. So a car could look more angular or not, um, also, uh, there are some really crazy ones out there. I don't know if you've seen them, like they'll go like from purple to yellow. Don't really care for them personally, but you know, they end up on Ferraris and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, Anna, I see someone right over there. Uh, it seems like everybody's building spaceships these days, rockets and everything else. Do you do uh, coatings for the various rockets and so on, or what purposes do they serve on the ships? Yeah, so we certainly are, and we have a very sizable aerospace business inside of PPG, so I didn't really highlight that, though. I put the F-35 up there. We make, um, we make stealth panels for that. We make uh, the canopies that go on it. We also make a series of sealants that go inside of aerospace, and they are on all the commercial uh, whatever space companies out there have our products on them. It's not always necessarily the outside paint that you see, although we are on some of those. We're not allowed to disclose which ones we're on, but I'll say that we are, our content is on all of them in some way, shape or form. Particularly, we have these uh, sealant materials that are really effective at very wide temperature changes, which is what happens in a spacecraft or what might happen in an airplane. They can go from very high temperatures to very low temperatures and they maintain their integrity. And that's a very unique to PPG technology that's inside of our aerospace business. So sort of a non-answer, but I really can't answer the question. <laughs> All right, who else has a question here for David? We've got one here in the front, and then we've got another one here. I'll get you next. Hi, uh, when you're talking about uh, the airplane coatings keeping heat out, are those bi-directional that they'd also keep heat in or are you able to make one-way coatings? That's a one-way coating to actually help the heat come out. And really the problem it's trying to solve is if you're running an airline, there's a significant energy cost when you're just sitting on the runway, particularly if you think of a company like Southwest, down south, right, those airplanes get hot, right? That's why they have you pull down the shades and everything. And you know, for years, you wouldn't see dark colors on airplanes. It was really being driven by that. You would see silvers and whites. Now you see a much richer color palette, and it's really that technology. Um, the again, the first airline I think to adopt it was Southwest, and it was the it was the blues and the reds that came out. But now you'll see like Alaskan airline might have a black or whatever on it, and it's really that because they don't. You know, it's really just wasted energy to sit there and cool an airplane down that's just absorbing heat because you chose a dark color. But it's only one direction one directional to answer your question. I uh, remember reading maybe about a year and a half ago or so about someone who made a thin film that uh, I think it was on top of something reflective that would reflect visible light. But when it would emit in the infrared, it would reduce those wavelengths that could be absorbed by CO2 and would be much cooler. Uh, any way to do paint like that, or is that possible? Yeah, that is possible. There's, um, you can actually use, uh, is that me causing that? No, okay. Uh, that is possible. Um, you can actually use wavelengths to go in, and if you use the right type of semiconductor material, there was a recent article that made a lot of press, even though the headline was wrong. It said the whitest white ever was formed. And if you actually read what they did, they did what's called active cooling. And they were using a barium material and it has what's called a band gap. So it's a semiconductor. And they were able to use the energy absorption of that to actually cool down the, the surface. So you can do it. It has limited applications today, mostly because the materials themselves that are needed for it, we just don't have them at a cost point yet where they can go into general, general usage. 
but yeah, it's absolutely possible. And I think, you know, maybe where you're thinking, right, is as the future is going forward with the really drives towards sustainability, I'm sure we'll see more and more of those types of solutions get implemented. All right, fantastic. Do we have some more questions? Anyone in the back? Any of the bad students in the back of the class? I'll see if you're throwing uh, <laughs> wads of paper back there. I've got my eyes on you. Uh, while folks are thinking about that, uh, David, I have a question actually. If we can go back to that uh, copper paint with the antimicrobial properties, uh, I, I found that to be very interesting because uh, a lot of aquarium keepers will use a copper solution to help uh, get rid of uh, infectious agents that might be uh, overtaking the aquarium. And uh, you know, my question is about the uh, the durability of that. So how uh, does that copper uh, coating in the paint last? Is it, you know, very susceptible to abrasion? Do you find that the copper stays in there, you know, over long periods of time? How, how does that last? So we would, we, today the product that we, I mean, this is brand new to the world. It got launched in December. You know, the hardest part about developing that product was as much showing that it had the anti- microbial and antiviral properties as it was making it so it could be colored in a consistent way. Because if you think about copper, it adds color into things. So it really changed the coloring schemes behind it. But we would say that product, we would say it lasts for two years at this point, probably lasts a lot longer. And why it really has to do with what's that cornering guardian technology. It's just a slow release mechanism. It goes right up there against the surface and we can get that what's called ion mobility into that surface. And a little bit of copper goes a long way on a on a wall surface overall. So. Great, thank you. Yep. That sounds like it'd have a lot of great applications in schools and other uh, high traffic areas like that. Absolutely, where that's our thinking. And I think you know, in general, people want a cleaner environment. There's a lot more. I mean, we all learned. I bet most people didn't know the difference between a virus and a microbe two years ago, and now everybody knows about viruses, right? Everyone's an expert. So the education of the society is really made us all more aware of things that we need to think about. Great. We have time for some more questions. We've got another one here in the front. Um, so the opposite of the white question was there was a story recently about the ultimate black bear that just totally sucked in all the light. And that got me thinking about, are you doing something with coatings in solar panels or something that would absorb more heat there? not necessarily photovoltaics, but more um, the thermal ones where you do that. Yeah, so that, that's right. There's the ultimate white and the ultimate black, and people are trying to make black blacker, and it's really just about sucking all the wavelengths as humanly possible into it. So we absolutely try to control that type of property inside of our products. Um, not in everything. I mean, it's not needed for everything. But uh, again, you would find that in, if you might you know, think about how you might make an airplane stealthy, that would be an important type of feature that you might wanna have on that, right? If you think about even the radar reflection of your car, and can we actually dampen and highlight where it might reflect from a radar standpoint, that's a feature that you might wanna have. There's also the heating and cooling. Could you use it as a heating area? So that, that wavelength management is an area for the right applications. We think not just about that one layer, but that coating stack and try to develop solutions for it. And we can manipulate it, now, can we do as well as the blackest black? Once again, no. I mean, the blackest black was a laboratory experiment and it's a good demonstration of what's possible, just not practical yet. But again, we can learn from those types of demonstrations overall. I like the audience, it's well read. You guys actually know some science. I mean, this is great. <laughs> We have one of the best audiences in all of Pittsburgh here at Cafe Sci. I can vouch for that for sure. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience this evening? Another one here? I uh, remember hearing a podcast about the types of coatings inside cans for beverages and that some of the coatings had uh, properties that would mimic like hormones that might exist biologically and other coatings have been developed that don't do that. Uh, can you elaborate on 
what research you've done or what products you have? Absolutely, you're referring to what's called bisphenol A or BPA, BPA-free coating. So for decades, decades and decades, the inside of cans were coated with an epoxy coating, which contained bisphenol A. And uh, bisphenol A is believed to be in what's called an endocrine disruptor, right, which is hurts reproductive health potentially. Now, whether a can, whether you can drink enough out of a can, whether it ever ends up in your body, these are all very debatable things. But certainly today, most cans no longer have BPA inside of them. And in fact, I had up on the slide and I didn't really talk about it. We have something which we call Innovel, which is a alternative technology to that. And it's BPA free. And more importantly, that learning in the industry about how packaging could have adverse effect on people changed fundamentally how technologies were developed. So there's a lot of uh, new technology that we developed inside of PPG specifically around what are called extractables and looking at how robust that coating is to really different types of beverages or foods and making sure that stuff just stays in the coating and that we're picking things from the coating that have really safe food contact properties or liquid contact properties. Now, it sounds really simple, but I'll tell you guys, I mean, if you start thinking about the variety of things that you're taking out of cans these days, you know, when that BPA issue started probably 10, 15 years ago, that was starting to hit the news. Big changes happened in the early 2013 kind of time frame. A lot of things changed. But what gets packed in cans is completely different. There were no seltzers. People weren't putting water inside of cans. You know, water is a pretty uh, good solvent. So it's a can be a tricky thing inside of a can and heaven forbid you start putting cannabis and stuff like that inside of cans, which people are doing these days. What we're being asked to stick inside these things has become really challenging. And so these test methods we have out in Moreauville is where our center is for this. You know, we have literally PhD chemists and they have instruments that cost more than my house that they basically are trying to look at, does anything come out in the part per trillion level, part per billion, and really show that that's a really safe product. It can go out there. So that food safety, it's one of the reasons it is so hard to coat a can. It's high speed, high, high speed manufacturing, very high tolerance, very low error rates, very demanding in terms of what you've got to be able to do with a very limited material set because of the food contact. That's why I put my trick question in all the time. So when you talked about the cans, you showed big aluminum rolls, and I know they'll then take those and stamp them out to get the can itself. So can you put a thicker coating on a roll of aluminum that would then spread, or are you actually painting the can once it's been stamped out into shape? Great question. There's actually a couple ways that they make them, and a typical beverage can would be first made into what's called a blank, which would just be a tube with an end on it, and then it's coated on the inside, coated on the outside, and then they put an end on it. The ends are exactly what you say. So those easy, those ends that you click open, right? Those go through somewhere, boy, I'm gonna get this wrong, at least 10 stamping operations, but they're coated first. And then they're hammered with stamping press and that coating has to survive that stamping operation. In, in um, there's different types of cans. So if you've seen like these bottle cans that look like a bottle, those, are coated and then they're stretched into the shape of the bottle. And so again, you've got to have a coating that's consistent, robust, and can take all those stamping operations. And the coating often plays multiple roles. Um, I kind of, again, glossed over the outside coating and how it, how it helps in the delivery process. It absolutely impacts those uh, stamping dies and tools. So there's like light lubrication inside of it so that it has just the right amount of friction so that the metal moves, but the coating doesn't tear. And it's very, very highly engineered process. Whoever figured this stuff out, because you know, certainly it happened before you know, I ever got involved in this type of science. I gotta say, they were a serious rock star of engineers who ever figured out how to do this stuff. It's super impressive. Going once, going twice. All right, David, thank you so much for speaking with us this evening and for taking all those uh, thoughtful questions.
And thank you all for coming out here tonight for Cafe Sci. Uh, our next Cafe Sci will happen right here at the Science Center on March 7th. And our guest is uh, Rana Zakrzeda from Duquesne University. She is a biomechanical engineering professor and uh, is doing a lot of interesting work. And I hope to see all of you here. And if any of you here have uh, been joining us online and, and asking those questions on the Zoom webinar, uh, feel free to stick around and introduce yourself. I'd like to put some faces with those names. Thanks for being here tonight, everybody.